everything you are training and building and evaluating, somebody else is already doing that. And in many cases, that has already been done by other people, all right? So once it starts, if you haven't done any of this early reconnaissance, you're way behind the power curve and you're probably screwing yourself and your team. How should your Minuteman group be set up? Organized, equipped, how should you train? What kind of funding should you put into it? Well, while we're out here all dude it up, go ahead and talk about it. I want to address a topic that is very important to this modern Minuteman militia community preparedness groups. It's a little bit higher up than the standard tactical individual level. So I'm going to approach this from, guess what? My Army infantry and 18 year Army career. Why? Because it's my only experience in that topic. Now there's a lot of similarities if you're looking at funding, equipping and training a group or a team. A lot of similarities to the military, but there will be a lot of major differences. So I think we're gonna cover some of those. There's nothing wrong with taking hundreds of years of military doctrine and field manuals that have been based on actual war and combat, training, equipping, funding, sustaining militaries. If there is one good thing the US military is good at, it is taking the lessons learned that actually apply to training and sustaining a fighting force. These lessons have been learned through hundreds of years of warfare, bloodshed, embarrassments. So we're gonna approach this in the context of a salad bar, cherry pick. We're gonna pick the good stuff, the good lessons learned, the things that might apply to us, and then we're gonna throw out the horse crap. So to start off with, you can see I've got my full loadout. This is the individual person loadout. We've got a day or patrol pack. And of course we have the second most important weapon because you, you are the most important weapon, but you gotta have a musket. So if you wanna see my video on what I believe should be a standardized Minuteman loadout, that will be linked somewhere up there or it will be down there in the comment section and the description. So go check it out. I think we should have some kind of standard loadout, bare minimum essentials that every dude should carry. And then teams and organizations will adjust based on the, guess what, Met TC, the environment, terrain, time, everything. That's how you should be looking at stuff. All right, so how does the military do this? Well, at least in the army, we call it a modified table of organization and equipment. Basically, every unit from division all the way down to a company, and in some cases a specific platoon, will have some kind of document. It's going to be a list of everything that unit should have on hand, most of the personnel in that unit, the positions of those personnel, and it's also going to include what those personnel should have issued to them. This is how units get their funding to buy trucks, repair things, get new equipment, um, get food. It's also how that unit decides once you show up and in process what you need to go to CIF to draw for that specific unit. Because as it turns out, every unit has a specific mission. So you can have two infantry companies, same types of guys, very similar weapons. But just because of the geographical location, they might have a different weapon system. They might be a mechanized unit that isn't going to be operating in mountains. It could be a light unit that's carrying lighter equipment. They're prepared for airborne supply drops. Maybe they're jumping in. Maybe it's an airborne unit. So there is a systematic method for this, how we actually decide this. And I think this is where the lessons come in. So. My time in the army, I'd say a good amount of it was doing garrison stuff, mandatory classes, cleaning stuff, cleaning barracks, cleaning weapons, uh, inventorying items, doing some PT, and then another large chunk of it was spent actually going out and training. 
And then a small percentage of it, despite being a grunt and being very active, a small percentage of it was spent actually deploying out there on the ground doing the mission. So how do we know how to do our mission once we get on the ground? Well, we train for it. How do we know how to train for that mission? Well, a lot of it comes from the actual mission. This is the Met TC, where we are going, what the operating environment is like, what the terrain and the weather is like, what our capabilities are. So we take our mission set, what we're actually deploying to do, and then we compare that to our MTO. Now we might be able to modify that MTO. Hey, if you're gonna send us to the mountains, uh, we don't want big old MRAPs and, and to be loaded down and shit like that. We want more chest rigs. We're not gonna wear plates. We wanna train that way. We're gonna need a lot of javelins. We're gonna carry more saws as opposed to the 240 because that thing sucks humping up and down hills, especially if you got a plate carrier. So I think you get the point. So how do we actually conduct that training? Well, this is where the Minuteman militia and all that comes from. You don't just haphazardly run out into the woods and start what kids are calling LARPing. On the individual level, yeah, you can go out there, you can practice patrolling techniques, staying off the roads, basic land navigation, your individual training, your individual tasks, we would call them. That's your land nav, communications, tactical movement, things like that. You get up to your team level when you start adding other personnel, now you're looking at collective tasks. Can you move as a team? Can you communicate as a team? You're gonna conduct bounding overwatch when contact is likely. You're gonna conduct battle drills. You're going to actually pretend, unless you have blanks, you're going to pretend you have a force on force engagement and you will react. Those are your battle drills. Battle drills are mostly the same, at least for the US side, they have been time tested. You always want to fire and maneuver using cover and concealment. You never want to just sit there, especially in a close ambush. Once you realize you, the leader has to determine the size of the enemy and if they can get the upper hand and they have to make a command decision. Can we take that hill? Can we take that enemy on with what we have where we are sitting right now? Yes, okay, let's go. Let's do it. Everybody knows what the standard operating procedures are. Everybody performs. This is why everybody trains on battle drills. From one dude, the individual level, in the woods, doing three to five second rushes, using cover and concealment, flanking around hills and such, all the way up to the collective level where we are maneuvering as a group. So how do we choose what kind of training we're gonna do? Well, again, it starts at the MTO. This is where your leaders or maybe you come into play. You need to sit down and look at the area you are in. Are you in high desert, mountainous regions? Are you in full on alpine mountains? Are you in what is almost like a rainforest up in the Northwest? Are you down in the central South where it's almost flat desert everywhere? Are you on high plains where it's like a desert during the summer, but when the monsoon season comes, it's 50 degrees and rainy for three months straight? So you have to identify your area, the terrain, the weather, the seasons. That would be your first step. Where the hell are we? All right. Next, you want to look at what you might need based on those considerations. So there's a whole slew of things you can use to determine what you might need. And I would say you can go reference U.S. Army 7-8. That's still a good old infantryman's Bible. You can also look at the newer one, 3-21.8. That is the U.S. Army Infantry Rifle Company. That's going to get into a lot of it. You can look at Department of the Army Leadership Manuals. Big old thick books, and it'll explain everything. Training the force, equipping the force. You can read through those. You can scan them on PDF and actually type in search terms to find stuff. That's a good starting place, but you have to know the environment that you are operating in. Next, we wanna look at personnel. Are you just a lone mountain man trying to put a group together and figure something out and you wanna start building your own doctrine before you start reaching out to people? 
might be a good idea. You might want to have some kind of presentation to hand people. Hey, I'm putting together a community response group uh, just in case people need support. And we're not talking about just shit hits the fan, but maybe some kind of catastrophe, wildfires, hurricanes. It's good to have groups like that who have SOPs and communications and healthy individuals willing to help out the community. And so it might just be a matter of showing up with a pistol hidden and just doing some aid work. It's not all about fire and maneuver. You should be prepared for that, but you should also plan for everything else that could happen in your environment. So as you are analyzing your environment, consider all that stuff. So once you have the personnel nailed down, you might wanna look at the personnel's capabilities. And then you're going to match their capabilities with what you think their capabilities should be. This is when you're gonna come up with lower level unit SOPs. You're gonna come up with standards. You should be able to talk on radios. You should be able to move. You should be able to shoot. But to what standard? Should it all just be Kentucky windage because we've got a bunch of guys with Winchester 3030s and we can't really dial everything in at 600 yards? Are a whole bunch of guys with shotguns showing up and that's all you have to work with? You're gonna to have to match your area when you do your area analysis you're gonna to have to look at the team that you have their capabilities and then physical fitness how do you test these guys I'll tell you right now in the mountains about half the guys I know that are into this stuff and half the guys I see out there LARPing I'm not taking them with me I will do my best to train them and get them up to a fitness level that I would deem okay or satisfactory but if shit went down right now, they're gonna be in the talk. They're gonna be looking at maps, monitoring radio traffic. They're probably gonna be our sustainment. Nothing wrong with that, all right? You might be a big dude that doesn't care about fitness, but you still wanna get involved. Great, man. We're gonna need all the bodies we can have. We're gonna need sustainment personnel. We're gonna need combo people. The older gentlemen who can't hike up and down these hills and possibly run up and down them and fight or survive for sustained days and nights out here with very limited equipment you guys probably have the wisdom wisdom usually does come with age we would be happy to have you guys on the sustainment team in the talk a roving talk supply you might be an excellent businessman but you're either older and can't move or you're bigger and can't move but you can be the guy linking up with the locals and actually building that relationship between us and the locals so that they actually support us because as it turns out we don't have army logistics you don't just get to call supply and ask for something and then they call up the echelons to get whatever you want minutemen militia guys by the book our entire history has been working with the local communities because that's where we freaking come from all right so you should already know all these key players the baker ranchers butchers farmers people with a lot of land where you can actually set up a temporary camp. Large open fields, you might have to set up a lot of tents for refugees, you might have to take care of people. You might have to set up a POW camp, all right? These are all factors that are gonna go into your local area analysis so you can start to build everything, your MTO, your training, how you're gonna train your personnel. Just like targets and everything, and your mission sets, what you're actually going to send guys out the door to accomplish and it could be a wide array of things it could be extremely wide you could be set up for just hurricane response and maybe you send a security team out with them for looting it could be wildfire response it could just be whatever there there's a lot of crime in your area and you want to start sending out patrols all of these mission sets you can actually identify issues in your area so whatever kind of current events you're having, but also historical things. So growing up on the Gulf Coast, we knew there was a hurricane coming every single freaking year, at least a few of them. Some of them tiny and we laughed at them, some of them major, but at least we knew when the season started and what to expect, all right? So that would be a historical event that we can actually plan on every single year. So when that season starts to begin around early August, well, we know to start prepping for hurricane. Out here in the summer, when it's dry as shit, around June, we know to start preparing for wildfires, all right? 
So that those are historical events. Those are things that are always going to occur that we should always have on the books to plan for. So let's get further down. So you take a specific mission, okay? Area security. Things aren't going too well and people are getting robbed, raped, murdered, beaten, what have you. And you wanna start sending out security patrols. All right, so we've got MTO. We've got the people on our team. We know what their capability should be. We know what standards we should have. How we're going to grade the training, what kind of training we're gonna conduct in the first place, how we're gonna grade them physically and how we're going to improve it all. All right, so you see how we're building up. Now we wanna look at our areas and specifically with sustainment. That is a major difference between military supply and what most of us would deal with. You're gonna to have to know everything about the community you are serving. You're gonna to have to be embedded with them. A major problem we had with the good insurgents in Ramadi and the Taliban in Afghanistan was they weren't some foreign fighters who came in and just pushed the people around. They were actually people living in those areas. Everybody knew who they were. They were among that community. They won the PSYOPs game. Lots of good people over there, but because a lot of the things we might have messed up, you know, it was easy to get them on the Taliban side. The locals were able to look past all the brutal atrocities they committed, the extreme Sharia law, the, the lack of freedom the women had and, and girls. I mean, but it's because they were really good at psyops and they could turn our mistakes against us. And they were also people from the community. They were locals. That's one of your most important strengths in any, any kind of situation like this. If you are from that community or you are at least embedded in that community and you already have identified key people in key locations, you're already halfway to victory. Now, this is something this community struggles with. A lot of these guys, in my experience, they want to cut themselves off, move out to the woods, and just talk to people on their phones. Well, I'm telling you guys right now, when shit goes down and you show up like this or however you want to show up and nobody knows who you are, they're not going to trust you and they're definitely not going to listen to you. No matter how many guys you show up with and all the guns, all right? You are going to be a foreigner. They're already going to be on edge. They're not going to know who to trust, but they're definitely not going to be listening to some outsiders who they've never seen before. All right. So this is community building, partnership building. Find all the local people who make things happen. Ranchers, farmers, mechanics, people who have big trucks and trailers, people who build shit, people in the healthcare industry. That's a major component that a lot of people seem to ignore is disease, sickness, and injuries. All right. You, you need to know who is a nurse or a doctor or even a surgeon that you can be buddies with and you're already talking to him about stuff. You know, when you head into your local bakery, if you still have those, you need to be friends with those people because they can feed people. I know everybody's terrified of carbs, but guess what? When you're hungry, you're going to be eating them. And carbs are very easy to produce. Bread is an essential. Ranchers, they own land. They have equipment. They can build shit. They can dig holes. They're probably going to have a bunch of tents. They're going to have fences. <laughs> They'll have supplies to make bombs. And they're also typically going to know all these other key people. So you're gonna to start to notice there's one or two guys in the community that everybody knows and trusts and everybody looks up to and they ask them for questions. Just like doing the CA stuff in Afghanistan, we would go down to meet village officials, the people that we put in place and oftentimes they weren't in charge of anything. They were guarding, they were sitting outside guarding the freaking grass. That's all they were allowed to do. So it was part of my job to go identify the key people who were actually making things happen. It was usually the village elders and most, if not all of them, were connected to the Taliban. It was what it was. But at least I was able to figure out who the hell was actually in charge in making things happen and who had power or influence to make things happen. Let's sum it all up and I'll give you guys a good acronym to help. Now, this is a good thing from the military. We use this in the civil affairs world. Area structures, capabilities, organizations, people, and events. Now, in the CA world, especially deployed or doing training in Eastern Europe, it was more of a civil thing for us to look at, but it was to identify all these major issues included in that as all the major role players of that area 
And for us, it wasn't really an Intel gathering system, although we did gather a lot of Intel that way that we could feed up to SOF and those guys. But for us, it was more of it just a civil information database. Now, there is a crosswalk that we call, it's PAMISI A-Scope. PAMISI is another acronym and you put the two together and you can kind of align things. You can do that if it helps, but you're gonna end up with tons of redundant information. So what we usually did, we would just line up a scope and then just fill those in and you can pretty much get all the information you need just from that and at least it is a solid starting point so a scope area structures capabilities organizations people and events look at your community in that way you can start to build your mto based off of that which feeds your training which feeds everything else and as always, try to keep things as simple and as dumb as possible. Kiss. Keep it simple. Stupid. If you really want to serve your community and, and, and help protect it and actually get along and, and grow that community and, and build something new or better, improve it, or just get through a damn catastrophe, you're going to have to put your ego to the side, your, your antisocial attitude. You're going to have to get out there on the ground meet and talk to people and i know the theme of the day is well everybody's a fed you can't trust anybody okay fine then stay home stay home don't go out and meet anybody don't get to know people so again when you show up like rambo you're either going to get shot by them or the people running things or and even worse it might not be good guys running things because nobody knew who the hell you were and somebody else already came in and took control of the show and you got to remember guys Everything you are training and building and evaluating, somebody else is already doing that. And in many cases, that has already been done by other people, all right? So once it starts, if you haven't done any of this early reconnaissance, you're way behind the power curve and you're probably screwing yourself and your team. So there you go, Grants. Hope you learned something. Let me know what you thought. Be sure to check out the other Modern Minuteman series. We're gonna have some fun with this and inject some good stuff and take out some of the bullshit from the military. I'll see you on the next one. Out.